Earl. For those of you who've been to each of our first four programs in this series on the first woman president, you know that our goal has been to break this important topic down into digestible component parts. We have featured a woman, Ambassador Carol Mosley Braun, who actually ran for president, been there, done that. A journalist, Eleanor Clift, who actually wrote the textbook on the subject, a book called Madam President. And last Tuesday we had pollsters highlighting the trends that have brought the American public around to the idea of a, f a female commander in chief. Tonight is going to have a little bit of a different focus and I'm particularly excited about it. We have with us this evening two political practitioners who actually know how this historic event will come about. We're extremely fortunate these two busy people have been able to join us all the way from Washington for our discussion. They've both run high profile presidential campaigns. They're both experts in women in politics, and they're both highly sought after commentators on the great issues of our day. Too many pages. Mary Beth Cahill is interim executive director of Emily's List, the nation's largest political action committee. In an earlier stint as executive director, she doubled the organization's membership from 24,000 to 50,000 and seeded scores of women's campaigns for public office with very necessary political money. She's also trained female candidates for political office in Russia, Macedonia, and Ireland. Before returning to Emily's List, Ms. Cahill served as campaign manager for John Kerry for president. Those of you who followed the race for the Democratic nomination last cycle might recall that before Ms. Cahill arrived, the Kerry campaign wasn't, well, performing all that well. Before joining the Kerry campaign, she was chief of staff to Senator Edward Kennedy and prior to that as assistant to the president and director of public liaison in Bill Clinton's White House. A native of Dorchester, Massachusetts, Cahill began her political career shortly after graduating from Boston's Emanuel College. She successfully managed Edward Markey's campaign for Congress and Patrick Leahy and Claiborne Pell's for the U.S. Senate. She also served as director for federal state relations for Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis. Please join me in welcoming Mary Beth Cahill. Tom Daffern is Chief of Staff for Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and previously served in the same capacity for two other senators, Fred Thompson of Tennessee and William Cohen of Maine. In 1999, he was the National Campaign Manager for Elizabeth Dole's campaign for the Republican nomination for president. Now, Senator Dole was the first woman to mount a serious effort to win a major party nomination, uh, her, a major party's political presidential nomination. Mr. Daffern also helped Susan Collins, a fellow Senator Cohen staffer in her losing 1994 campaign for governor of Maine and in her successful Senate race two years later. He has quipped that he has, quote, a significant experiences, experience with the challenges facing women candidates. Mr. Daffern holds degrees from Brown and Columbia universities, served in the Peace Corps, and won fellowships from the American Political Science Association and the Stennis Foundation. Oh, and get this, he briefly left politics to serve as senior vice president and head of business operations for the Baltimore Orioles in the early 1990s. I'm a Yankee fan, and even I think that's, to borrow the New England vernacular in honor of tonight's guest, wicked awesome. Moderating tonight's, oh, please, welcome Mr. Tom Daffron. Thanks, Tom. Moderating tonight's discussion on the path to the presidency, how she will win, is Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. You all know him well. Bill. Hope so. Thank you, John. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. Good, Richard. Thanks for joining us. Oh, we're so delighted. Yes. Uh, we're delighted that uh, all of you could be with us tonight. This is going to be a really fun session, and um, it's particularly uh, of fascinating to me because um, even though uh, Tom and I have known Tom for over 20 years now, and I met Mary Beth for the first time, we are all members of a kind of a small, I don't know if we'd call it, say, fraternity or sorority of individuals who've managed pr presidential campaigns. And, once you've been through that experience, you always have an enormous amount of respect for the other folks who have done that. And so uh, this, this should be a fascinating discussion tonight. 
Tom, I wanted to start with you really tonight um, and ask you about Elizabeth Dole's campaign. Senator Dole, she's become a senator since the campaign, but she's arguably the most competitive woman candidate that we've had for president so far. Why did, did, did you feel that uh, she could win the presidency and ultimately what went wrong with the campaign? Well, let me let me hope that this is working. Can can you hear me? Good. Um, well, we felt uh, I think we were not unaware of the fact that uh, that uh, George Bush was certainly a prohibitive favorite going into the into the election. But we felt that Mrs. Dole had significant executive experience, having run two cabinet departments. Uh, she uh, also was you know had been president of the Red Cross. Uh, she did a you know a very uh, significant. Uh, and a uh, press-worthy event when she uh, seconded the nomination of her husband in 1996. She was a sought-after speaker at a lot of different Republican events. Uh, we thought that with her, with her experience that she might have a, uh, an opportunity to, uh, to provide a serious competition. We also had polling numbers that showed while uh, President Bush or then Governor Bush was the uh, strongest candidate against Al Gore that Mrs. Dole in most of the matchups uh, ran uh, uh, almost as well. So we thought there was an opportunity. I mean, we, you know, I think that uh, if we uh, had it to do over, we'd, there are a lot of things we might change, but, but we thought there was an opportunity for, for her to become a competitive candidate, and because at that point, people have to remember that Governor Bush had only been, he'd been governor of Texas for, uh, you know, slightly, slightly over four years. He really, his experience was not that extensive either, and while Mrs. Dole had not held elective office, she had a a fairly extensive uh, resume in the public uh, policy area. Um, what ultimately happened, and the reason that the campaign foundered, is that it was largely was a question of money. Uh, the Bush people had put together a organiz nationwide organization, pioneers, rangers, uh, you know, with, with many, many, many different levels, and in a, in a fundraising effort really uh, had, which has not been, uh, uh, had not been seen prior to this time, raised, you know, eventually, uh, you know, you know, more than $100 million, and last time $200 million. Um, and we felt that, and, and we found that while we were able to be competitive with all the other candidates, there were eight, eight, <coughs> uh, eight candidates in the race, that we were eventually just drowned uh, in, in, uh, in, the fundra in fundraising. We, we actually withdrew from this race before any, any legitimate uh, uh, votes had actually been counted, uh, because the, the, you know, the, the coin of the realm was how much money you'd raised. And, Elizabeth got into the race the first week in March, in the first reporting period, which ended in March of 1999. She had raised about $700,000, and Bush had raised $7 million. We thought, okay, we're new. Next time it'll be better. Uh, three months later, he was at $27 million, and we were at 2.7. And those of you who are math majors will see that's still 10 to 1. And that's when we knew we, we, were, we were in some difficulty. It was a function largely of money. Now, the campaign had other problems, some of them having to do with gender, some of them having to do with, uh, with, with uh, you know, issues involving, uh, you know, a lack of, uh, of organizational or strategic planning uh, far enough in advance. Um, you really need to, you know, to plan a campaign, you know, well in advance. And that, and the most important amount of organization you can put together is a financial organization. We didn't have it. The Dolls were very, very disappointed that People who'd supported Bob Dole in 1996 were now with Bush. Uh, it was not clear that she was going to run until a few days before she decided to do it. So she started with a lot of handicaps. At the same time, we felt it was, a, it was, a, it was worth a shot. Uh, we felt that if he foundered, most of his votes would go to her. We had almost all of the Bush vote, the Dole was the second choice. It would require him to make a mistake, and it required us to remain competitive until such time as, as he could be engaged. We didn't have the financial resources to do that, and uh, that's the that's why the, uh, the the campaign did not work out. But I think all of us who were involved in it think it was a uh, it was certainly worth doing, and uh, and it, it was historic in that it was the first serious campaign, with all due regard to Margaret Chase Smith and Shirley Chisholm and various other people. It was the first serious campaign by a female candidate for president, and I think paved the way for what I think will be many more downstream. Mary Beth, you, you have been involved with EMILY's List, and uh, that's an organization that is actually designed to get early cash into campaigns. Speak a little bit about 
Emily's list and why it was set up and uh, also explain who Emily was because I don't think I even knew that title. I looked it up the other day. But then put that in the context of the importance of early money in a presidential campaign for a woman candidate. I'd like to first note that I'm the Democrat up here and I'm on the right. <laughs> Emily's List was founded in 1985 because up until that time, no Democratic woman had ever been elected to the United States Senate in her own right because they did not have access to the same sorts of networks that Tom was just talking about, that bankrolled candidates. They weren't members of the Kiwanis. They weren't members of the Chamber of Commerce. They weren't often partners at law firms. And so Ellen Malcolm, Emily's List um, stands for early money is like yeast. It makes the dough rise. So if you give a little money early on, you help a woman become viable because people look at her cash on hand and they say, okay, she can do this. I'm going to take a chance on this. Ellen Malcolm, the woman that started Emily's List, watched Harriet Woods run for um, Senate in Missouri in 1984, and she was completely access to the same capital that her opponent did. And Ellen said, I'm just not going to let that happen. So she called 34 friends. In, in, in uh, 1986, there were um, two women running for the United States, United States Senate, Harriet Woods again and Barbara Mikulski in Maryland. And she invited 34 women over to her basement and said, bring your Rolodex. And they wrote a letter to every single woman they knew and asked them to send some money to Harriet Woods and Barbara Mikulski. And in 1986, Barbara Mikulski, against all odds, became the first woman ever elected in her own right um, to the United States Senate. And Ellen said, well, this works, and I'm going to take it on the road, and I'm going to make it something much bigger than it is. Emily's List went from that small beginning to right now being the largest pack, as Bill said, with, um, I think, $37 million they raised in the 2012. Right now, there are 67 women in the House. There are 14 women in the Senate, and there are eight women governors, very happily and proudly, your governor here in Kansas. And so we have a long way to go. But almost every Democratic woman who wins runs and wins with the help of Emily's List. The whole idea <coughs> is that if you can't get money the way through the networks that men get it, we're going to make our own network up, and we're going to get there uh, differently, but we're going to perform well once we get there. And speak to the importance of, of early money in a presidential campaign. You just went through the campaign with Senator Kerry, but, and you guys, I think, generally speaking, didn't have those very many financial issues. But speak to the kind of situation that a woman presidential candidate could, could find herself in. Well, we were talking about this before. We Can everybody hear Mary Beth, by the way? Is your, is your mic on? Mine's too loud. I'll lower mine here. So. Okay. Is that better? No. Mr. Bush is going to come and help me. There we go. Great. Okay, turned it up. Um, the importance of money in politics is impossible to overstate because money creates opportunity. And if I had known when I took over the Kerry campaign on... Um, November 13th, that the campaign was very close to broke, I'm not sure that I would have taken it. Because, you know, we knew that, that we were about to go into the vortex of Iowa and New Hampshire, and Kerry had been the front runner, had taken a precipitous slide, and was um, now in a position where he was just trying to write his campaign and try to do what was possible um, to show creditably in those states. Fortunately, he was able to mortgage his house in Boston. And um, that's $6 million. And fortunately, he had a house that was worth $6 million. But that money had to carry us through the Iowa caucuses and uh, the New Hampshire primary. And every cent, believe me, was budgeted for that. Right now, I mean, this is an extraordinary year uh, where, the, for the first time in a long time, the House of Representatives is in play and where a lot of the top challengers in the country are actually women. And so getting money into those races early, say if there are to uh, top 50 house races, I think 24 of the challengers are women. They need the resources to compete often against uh, incumbents. 
You don't need to have the same amount of money, but you need to have the money to carry out the plan that you've laid out. And uh, I think it's impossible. The one thing that, that Tom and I discussed on the way here is your financial resources really make your opportunities. And Emily's List tries to do that for women's candidates. Senator Clinton is going to be, provided that she gets in, into the presidential campaign sometime next year, she is going to be the first woman to seek the presidency with excellent funding. Could both of you kind of speak to what you feel her chances are of winning the Democratic nomination and also winning the presidency? Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, I think her chances are excellent uh, uh, because I think she has, as someone said earlier, she has uh, money. She's got virtually no opposition and 13, 14, 16, 17 million dollars in the bank. She has a very, very good start and a capacity with the help of her husband, even, but even on her own, to raise uh, enormous sums of money. I think she is, uh, I think she is uh, way ahead in the polls and the money tends to follow up uh, the polling. And right now she has, well, she has a variety of different uh, opponents who are at, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 percent. She's, you know, somewhere over 40. And that, that makes her look like a probable nominee, which means more money should, should come to her. She's also, they, she's, she's very well organized. Uh, she's, uh, she's also covered some of the issues that are sometimes difficult for women by, you know, and defense and economics tend to be tough issues for, for women from a perception standpoint, whereas health and education are good issues. And I think that she's on the Armed Services Committee. She speaks out. She's traveled a great deal. She's been to Iraq. She's been to Afghanistan. And I think that from the standpoint, a lot of Republicans, which is the people I, a lot of the people I talk to, think that, that even if she's nominated, she can't win a general election. I don't, I don't think that's true. I think that she can. I think that you can make a very respectable intellectual case that she'll win all the states that carry one, plus Arkansas. And if she picks a, a vice president like Mark Warner, she could win Virginia. But, and Ohio is in very difficult shape. She could pick that up. There are a lot, there's a lot of ways that Mrs. Clinton could win this thing. So I think the Democrats are, I mean, the Republicans are whistling in the graveyard if they think she can't win a, a general election. And I think the reason that I think they probably understand that is they're already attacking her. And it's relatively early. And she isn't the nominee at this point. Uh, I mean, the, this whole point about how she has a short fuse, which came up last week, came up in our last meeting. My own opinion is that she's a very credible candidate. She's a serious candidate. And the interesting point that, that Mary Beth made when we were at dinner was that you hardly ever hear anyone speak about her gender. I mean, if this isn't, gee, she's the female candidate, she is the front runner. And that's a much different situation. And that, I think, shows in many ways how far we've come. Well, in 2004, Hillary Clinton was also the, the front runner. And she chose not to get in. And I take her at her word, having watched her decide to run for the Senate when she was in the White House and I was working for her husband, that she's going to go at this with a, an absolute pragmatism and an absolute um, view to having the assets and having the organization to make sure that if she gets in, she can win. I don't think she'll get in otherwise. However, right now, as Tom said, she has $17 million. John Kerry has 15.3. They are quantum leaps ahead of everybody else um, who is looking at the, the democratic field at, at this point in, in my um, estimation. The other thing I want to note is that the world is really changing in that we just watched um, an election take place in Germany where Angela Merkel was elected and you know, ch it has changed that country. We, there's a woman chief executive in Chile. There's one in the Ukraine. This, I mean, we're, and we've seen polls, and maybe we'll talk about them later. CBS New York Times last week said that, I mean, 58% of Americans said that they would consider a woman for president. So this might be one of those moments where there's a synchronicity between the time and the candidate. And I think that um, that could very well happen. I would just add one thought to that is that I think, you know, the conventional wisdom is that on, you know, that in terms of public perception, women are perceived as having, uh, or men are perceived as, as generally stronger on issues like defense, economics, uh, uh, decisiveness, uh, and women on health, education, the environment. But I think one, one issue that women are also perceived generally as being a, 
uh, stronger on his ethics. And Washington right now with the Abramoff situation is a, is, uh, is a, uh, is a mess. And, uh, and I think that somebody who can, who can come in and try and, uh, and, and, uh, and change the ethical tone in, in Washington is I, th I think something which would be a, a, a modest advantage for a, for a female candidate. In other words, I think, I agree with Mary Beth, I think the environment is, is right now so that uh, it, it no longer would be a great surprise if there was a presidential nominee who were uh, a female. The White House project, uh, which aspires to elect a woman president, did uh, had some research done late last year. And I wanted to share some of these numbers uh, with our guests and with all of you tonight and get you to comment on you know, how tough is it for a woman to run for president given, some, given this difference in attitude. Uh, they asked the question, are you very or somewhat comfortable with the notion of a woman being president of the United States, along with a series of other roles that women might fill? And so uh, they asked, like, you know, as head of a charity organization, 97% felt comfortable. As head of a large retail company, 96.5. As head of a law firm, 96.1. Member of Congress, 95.4. Uh, head of a large financial institution, 94.7. Head of a large technology company, 94.1. You go on and on and on. You come to uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, 89.8. But down at the very bottom is General in the Military at 73.1, and next up, President of the United States at 79%. So obviously, there's still a lagging in American public opinion on that issue. What kind of unique challenges does that create for a woman's candidacy? And specifically, uh, how important is it for a woman to develop an image of being tough and decisive? Well, I think, first of all, that these things are always particular. And so when you talk abstractly about, you know, a woman as head of charity or, you know, as a nurse, like, obviously that's going to be a, uh, you know, something that people can, can see. I think the fact that both, there was also a poll this past week because, unfortunately, even though I've the Kerry campaign is over, I still read every poll I can get my hands on. Um, Siena College did that showed that both Condoleezza Rice and um, Hillary Clinton were perfectly acceptable to, in the high 50s and in one case the low 60s of Americans. And that includes American men. And that is really one of the um, difficulties that a female candidate for president is going to have to get over. Um, because Women vote at a higher rate for women candidates, and that has been the case in almost every race that I've ever seen across the country. Um, the higher the office, the more necessary it is that, that the candidate be able to convince the electorate that she is decisive, that she knows where she stands, that she comes at her position through principle, that she's grounded. And when she does that, you know, if it's Governor Janet Napolitano in Arizona, with obviously there's been an enormous Im immigration um, discussion going on in Arizona. She laid out principles early, and the electorate accepted them. And that's a very tough state for Democrats, and she's going to be reelected handily this year. I think that when you, you know where you're going, you know what you think, and you know how to marshal the resources to get there, then a woman can win. Uh, I think that. Uh that I think, uh, as Mary Beth alluded to, I think you know you're dealing with something that hasn't happened, and until it happens, it's always sort of a breakthrough. And I think you have to deal with you know uh, you know specificity. I mean, you know, a, a generic statement about whether or not you would vote for a woman to do X or Y is less important than would would you support specific candidate a, a, sp a specific candidate. I think there are a variety of different hurdles that that women have to overcome, but I think there's also some opportunities. And one of the things we I talked about the fundraising, you know. The problems we had in the Dole presidential campaign, and you know, because you know, necessity is the mother of invention, we decided to go out and find. We just started looking for women because all of the men were taken by George Bush, uh, and we, you know, we started saying we just you know, going to list after list after list after list, and we brought a whole lot of new people into the process. And I think what you can do is, while I think women vote in larger numbers than men and have, uh, in from a proportion standpoint, every presidential election since 1980. The percentage has been higher, and everyone since 1964, the raw numbers have been higher for, for female participation. In terms of political activism, people being you know, directly involved, and by that I mean 
contributors. There's been, a, there's been a bit of a lag. But, you know, women have an awful lot more women have income now, and I think they can help solve this, this money problem and I think can, can contribute to, uh, to having a, a female president. But I think what it comes back to is the individual, that a specific individual. And I think, uh, you know, if you start with the idea that 57% of the, the people in college right now are female, almost all professional schools are majority female, you got women CEOs, you've got, uh, you know, women who are managing partners of law firms, you've got women in the, 14 women in the Senate, and again, as, as Mary Beth mentioned, there was Barbara Mikulski was one. That was only in 1986. Well, there was Nancy Kasselbaum at the same Nancy, time. Nancy, there was two, and so, she was a committee yes. chairman. So there were two. But, you know, we're dealing with, you know, big increases uh, in, uh, in, in the numbers of women, and I just think it's now reached the point of not so much if, but when. Tom, you mentioned earlier a little bit about the, the differences in uh, approaching, a, you know, message for a woman candidate. Could both of you speak to, if you were advising a woman candidate for president, you know, what are the advantages and the disadvantages that you would want to go over with a candidate in terms of what message they were taking out on a daily basis to the American voters and to the media? Well, I think the first thing I would tell a woman candidate is find a hairstyle and stick with it. <laughs> because otherwise they're going to write about that instead of what it is that you say. And you want them to focus on what it is that you have to say. I think that in every election year there, there's something that is an issue that's difficult for women. I remember, I think it was in the 96 or 98 cycle, there was a huge debate going on in the country about three strikes and you're out uh, in, uh, in terms of sentencing. And, you know, a lot of women candidates wanted to start out talking about, well, education, making the family stronger. It just doesn't work. You have to say what penalty you're for, regardless of what it is. You, if, if you're against whatever the, the issue is being discussed, you have to make your position clear and that you have to, once again, give the principles that lead you to talk about that. And, you know, I think actually there was an interesting um, discussion about this in the, in the Virginia governor's race that just ended, where um, Virginia is obviously um, a death penalty state and Kane um, Lieutenant Governor Kane is against the death penalty because he is an extremely strong Catholic. He talked about it from that basis and it became a hurdle that he could get over. I think that you have to, as um, Tom just said, I really watched a candidate in 2004 and I have more than watched a candidate in 2004 who wanted to talk about the economy, who wanted to talk about health care, who wanted to talk about energy independence and every night the nightly news would drag you back to Iraq and talking about Iraq and terrorism. I think that's going to be the same in 2006 and it's definitely going to be the same in the 2008 um, election cycle. I think women candidates who are running for the House, for the Senate or for President are going to have to demonstrate their bona fides on um, their willingness to do whatever is necessary to keep the country safe because that's what the voters are looking for and that's the threshold then you can go on and talk about the other issues that you know, people really feel at this point in time are not getting enough attention in the country. Uh, I'd, uh, I, mean, I, I agree with that. I think the security issue becomes a, a very difficult one uh, for a woman because of a, uh, uh, just because of, a, of, of, of perceptions. But I think they'd also like to deal a little bit, uh, she made, Mary Beth made a you know, brief reference to the hairstyle thing and I think one of the things that I think you see in the, in the press and a lot of it's really sort of insidious is that there are a variety of things that female candidates have to deal with whether it's you know president, congress, state legislature that males don't. Um, uh, I, uh, I've done a lot of work for a senator named Susan Collins from Maine who worked for me many many years ago and in her first campaign for, uh, for a governor uh, she was single and 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 now, if a man is single and he's running for office, they say, well, what a dashing young bachelor he is. For a woman, you know, why isn't she married? Or is she a lesbian? Or, you know, or, or, you know whatever, whatever. But you, you deal with this. If, she's got, if she is married and has three little children, then they say, as a friend of mine who was going to run for governor in Tennessee this year, they said, well, you'd be neglecting your children. Now, they don't say that to the man. Uh, there's also the appearance issue. One night during the Collins Senate race in 96, I got a call from a friend of mine who's a 
There's a faculty member at Bowdoin said his wife had to talk to me. And I said, what is it? He said, she's got some ideas for the campaign. So she comes over to my house. It's 11 o'clock at night. We're near the end of the campaign. And she says, and I said, well, what is it, Sam? And he says, well, you've got to get her out of the, the red outfits and into blue. And I thought, now, all the male campaigns I work, uh, that I work with, Nobody ever cared whether the guy looked like he just fell out of the dryer, or whether, you know, whether he wore his gray suit or his blue suit. Nobody cares. Um, and I, th I think, you know, that the appearance thing is, you know, you know, too bad. It's lamentable. I think female candidates have to deal with it. There's also the question of, of being a candidate and being a woman. A woman, you know, man gets tough. A woman gets too shrill. She gets criticized. So, there's a, you know, there's a... There's some sort of happy medium that you have to deal with here. And uh, again, deploring it is, you can deplore it all you want, but it's a fact. And you have to deal with it. The question is, behave like the run-of-the-mill perception of what a female should be. And at the same time, show that you're strong and tough and can make decisions. And, and this is tough. These are the kinds of decisions that men don't have to make. Uh, and Last story, but it, this involves a woman named Tilly Fowler, who was a, just, just died fairly recently, a very close friend of Elizabeth. She's a congresswoman from, from uh, Florida. And she got together in the first day of a congressional session, got together all the female members for a meeting on something. And Roll Call, which is the newspaper on Capitol Hill, took a picture of, the, of all the women, but it was only from the knees down. And it showed that this year they're all wearing black sensible pumps. And she wrote a very nasty uh, letter to the editor in which she said, you know, the next, the next uh, editor is going to... Uh, the next picture or in next week's issue is probably going to show are the men wearing wingtips or are they wearing penny loafers. I mean, that's the sort of thing that is, it's sort of, it's supposed to be funny, but it's diminishing. Uh, Elizabeth's campaign, uh, some guy wrote a, letter to the editor, wrote a letter to the editor and said she wore pastel suits and he said she looks like a Jordan almond. Now, uh, you know, that may be funny, but it's, it's also sort of degrading. Susan Collins asked some tough questions of Rumsfeld in a hearing. And it said, Susan Collins, wearing a burgundy suit and dangling earrings, still had a tough question for Don Rumsfeld. Well, well what does that have to do with, uh, with her ability to ask a tough question of Don Rumsfeld? And I think you have to kind of sort of educate people that candidates are candidates. And, you know, whether or not their earrings and their shoes and these things don't make any difference. But I think there's an awful lot of focus on appearance. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you know the, the hairstyle thing. I mean... Uh, Hillary Clinton talked to a senator I work for and said, you know, she just got so mad, you know, that once every six weeks there was a story about her new hairstyle. And Mary Beth said she solved it by Jesus stopped changing it. But, you know, it's, uh, it, those kinds of things will, will drown out everything else you do. And that's the difference between, the, that's the burden that female candidates face, I think. And it, it's very, very difficult. One of the things that really interests me is that if Elizabeth Dole uh, had been elected president. Bob Dole would have been the first gentleman. If Senator Clinton runs and is elected, Bill Clinton will be the first gentleman. Uh, and it harkens back to 1984 when Geraldine Ferraro was on the Democratic ticket. And one of the big issues was her husband's income tax situation. Can both of you kind of speak to this very interesting notion of, you know, the first guy who becomes the first gentleman and how that affects the dynamic of the campaign? I'll start. Um, I don't watch Commander-in-Chief, first of all. <laughs> and actually, I think that that is doing a lot to get people ready for the idea that eventually there will, there will be a man who will live in the White House with his wife, who is the president. But the thing that I really remember about the um, Ferraro press conference was that, you know, this was a marriage in which, as so often happens, one partner takes charge of the sort of checkbook and the taxes. And the first time that she really saw all of this stuff was when a background story had been done on her husband's taxes and had he paid enough of them. What she found out was that she had two daughters and one son and that her husband had been putting more money away for the son than she had for her two daughters. And what I remember from that press conference was her volcanic anger that her three children were going to be treated differently. That was a long time ago. And I think now candidates approach um, a higher office knowing that you have to have all these ducks in line before you run. 
that you have to have your finances it all straightened out. You have to know what your mortgages are. You have to know what your financial obligations are. Because, you know, we all learned the lesson of the last campaign. But once again, this is uncharted territory. And so we don't know what it's going to be like to be a first gentleman. And it isn't a generic question. It's a particular question that's going to have an awful lot to do. I, I just read the John Adams um, biography, which I saw in your office. And the way that Martha Washington inhabited the office of the First Lady is something that we are still living with because she was the gracious chatelaine of the, um, the President's manse. She held levees on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. And for generations, that's what the First Lady did. So it's going to matter a great deal who that person is and how they inhabit that office. I think there's a, uh, you know, a substantial difference between a, if a Bill Clinton or a Bob Dole is the person who becomes I mean, they're, they're, they're those sort of, you know, sort of equal partners. It's uh, for the a more complicated situation when the partner is, uh, you know, is, is more anonymous. Uh, and I do know from, just from anecdotal information from the 14 uh, women senators get together and they talk about these sorts of things on a semi-regular basis. And uh, it's interesting that for, you know, most of the male senators who come to Washington bring their, they bring their families with them or they leave them home, but it's a, it's a fairly stable situation. A lot of the men who came to Washington with their wives as senators, it became just a very, very difficult, difficult situation for them. And a lot of them went back home to, do, to, to continue to work out there I mean, then they, because they never see their wives during the week anyway. Uh, I have an interesting situation in that, in that the senator I work for is, I believe, the only female senator with teenage kids. I mean, her kids are 12 and 16. Uh, Mary Landrieu and Blanche Lincoln have Little very, kids. very young children, and and the others have either either have no children or the kids are grown. And and for Lisa, the senator I work for, it's just a very very difficult situation for her to make sure that she gets to all the basketball games, uh, that she that she. F that she, uh, you know, she functions and does all the things she thinks a mother should do. Uh, and for the first two years she was there, she commuted to Alaska, which is 10 hours each way every weekend. And it's also complicated for her husband, who had a very, very good and thriving business in, in Alaska and was a figure in his own right. And now he's sort of an anonymous appendage, and that creates stresses. And I think it's, I think you're dealing with a whole lot of different situations. I mean, you know, Mary Beth's correct when the economics have to all be in a, in, in a in line and you have to make sure that you don't violate any of the ethics laws. But I think the strain that it has on families is, 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 uh, is be can become very, very substantial because the, just the demands on, on, the, uh, on the female office holder are, are huge and that there's also the pull to try and maintain the, uh, uh, you know, be the anchor of the family, which in the real world most women are. Uh, and it, I know the, one, the, the families that I've observed, it's, it's, it's very difficult and I think uh, in the White House, you have you know support systems that you don't have in the in the Senate, and I think that might make it a little bit simpler. And also, by the time people get to the to the, have the uh, to the age that they can run for president, it, generally their kids tend to be grown or or older. I mean, it's uh, although Chelsea, Chelsea was relatively young, but but again, you had a situation in the White House where. Uh, uh, but I think if 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 uh, if uh, if either well if. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton became the uh, uh, the first spouse. I, I think he would have, you know, <laughs> so he'd have, he's had some experience. He had eight years of experience, so I think he probably shouldn't have a lot of trouble with it. But I do think it creates all kinds of uh, of stresses that are that are much different than the than what's been the norm over the last two hundred years. How does? And let me just pursue this one more simple question. I mean, how does Bill? Let's say Senator Clinton does make the race. I mean, doesn't every time former President Clinton speak, isn't that going to get picked up and isn't that going to complicate her campaign to a certain extent? Sure. And every time that, I mean, I think the difficult thing will be for the Clintons. I mean, Mrs. Clinton knows what she thinks about things. I mean, she's established a record. The fact that she's come back the way that she has in northern New York, which is a very different part of the state from downstate New York, and she's doing equally, not quite equally, but extremely well, and, you know, she's going to win this 2006 race handily, is a tribute to the incredible hard work she's put into this. Every time that you're 
spouse says something, you know, it gets picked up. And especially if it's something that's off the script. And that happened a lot in both the primaries and the general election in 2004. We just saw the um, Coretta Scott King funeral where, you know, Bill Clinton gets up there as only he can, the most talented politician in a generation, and completely without notes starts to, you know, talks about Coretta Scott King and about the country incredi incredibly movingly. It's very hard to follow that. It's hard for anybody to follow that. And they're going to have to work that out over the, in the course of the, um, of the campaign. I really saw in 2004 that in the early primaries, you'll do almost anything for, for press and attention because it's so hard to come by in Iowa and New Hampshire when there are eight or nine candidates. And Bill Clinton will certainly help with that. But the minute that you win the nomination, the country wants to see the individual who they're going to have to make a decision about. And that person has to stand there on their own. So I think it will, you'll see that this will be an episodic thing. But because the Clintons, like the Doles, had been through this before, they understand it better than almost anybody else does. Well, we had, with the Dole campaign, we had a situation where she was well known and she'd had, uh, you know, and had, 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 had some prominence, but he'd been the, you know, the most recent nominee. He was in, in the Senate Majority Leader, and uh, every utterance that he made was, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, made news. And, and I think that's a situation which is, I think, analogous to what the Clintons will face. Uh, at one point, uh, there was a story on the front page of the New York Times that he had given John McCain a thousand dollars. Well, that, and then we had several press conferences on whether he was for Elizabeth or whether he was for John McCain, and, you know, everything we did for two weeks disappeared because of, you know, Bob Dole would give you a thousand bucks to anybody, frankly. I mean, that's the way he is. You know, you want to check? Sure. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm sure McCain asked him for some money, and they were, they were friends, and McCain put his name in nomination in 1996, and I don't think he ever thought for a minute how it would be perceived, that you'd look like you're not supporting your own wife. And that was what the, we had a lot of press conferences, and then we, you know, we had a lot of internal discussion on whether we ought to say we've taken Bob to the woodshed or whether we should ignore it or whether we should... We should thank Bob for his, his undying support and, and so forth and so on and say he supports all Republicans, all Republicans. And, but it, my point is that because of the influence that people like President Clinton and, and Senator Bob Dole have is that they really need to have somebody watching over them too. They, they need to have their own staff. I mean, and in Dole 96, Elizabeth had her own staff in in. 2000, Bob did not have his own staff, and he was, you know, he was out on the road, and it, it was, it created occasional problems, and uh, and it and not for any la any malice, but just because of, uh, uh, you know, it was it's difficult to coordinate a guy who's been a presidential nominee. I mean, he's got you know a certain amount of panache in his own right. I have one one last question I want to ask, and then we're going to open up to your questions, um, and and it's going to be kind of a leading question because I think the two of you have spoken loudly and clearly on this topic, but I want to make sure. Uh, I think what I've heard tonight is that there isn't a series of scenarios that are possible that a woman will be elected. It is rather a totally individual thing. It's going to be based totally upon the individual candidate, the candidates that she is running against, and then the events and the occurrences. It's going to be like every other campaign. Is that a fair assessment of what both of you have been saying tonight? From my standpoint, uh, it is. I think that sometimes the environment changes, and the time, but I think as more and more women hold, you know, prominent offices, I mean, if you have 14 senators where you used to have two, and you have, you know, 68 or 67 members of the House, and you have, and you, have uh, you know, eight governors, you know, your universe of possibilities just becomes larger and larger, and, you know, sooner or later, the time, timing is going, to be, is going to be right. And I think, you know, the most obvious individual right now is Senator Clinton, but I think, you know, if Condoleezza Rice decided to seek national office, I think she'd have an enormous following. And I, I think, you know, it's, you know, in the old days, you were sort of dealing, you know, with an inside straight. You know, you've got, you've got one possibility or two possibilities out there, and, and, and uh, now you've got so many possibilities that the law of averages says it's just very likely to happen. But I agree with Bill. It, it depends on the specific individual and her specific skill set. Uh, and I think uh, as women get more and more hardened by more and more campaigns and have more and more understanding of how this process works and how to prepare. And uh, 
I think that the likelihood is very high. Well, after 2004, you could never have convinced me that Howard Dean would be the front runner for the Democratic nomination starting off that year because I knew him when he was lieutenant governor of Vermont and the idea that you would go from lieutenant governor to governor of Vermont and then lead the Democratic primary really did lead me to, to begin to believe in the love of unidentified flying objects that you never <laughs> really know what is going to happen until you get going. The thing that I think is going to be fascinating about this year is that for the first time in a long time, there's going to be a very robust contest on both sides for the nomination. The Republicans are so much more disciplined than the Democrats are in the selection process and in being pragmatic about making a decision on uh, getting behind an eventual winner. This time around, I don't think maybe these gentlemen know a lot more about this because they know a lot more than the candidates than I do about the candidates than I do, but I don't have any sense that any of them is a front runner right now. And I don't think there's a front runner on the Democratic side. The one thing I know from having worked for John Kerry, he was the front runner. He, then he was at 11 in New Hampshire, and then he won the nomination. And, you know, he came with in, uh, two and a quarter percentage points of winning the, the presidency. So, Rosanna, Rosanna, Dana, you never know. I think, on the, <laughs> I think on the Republican side, though, there's been a history that there has not been on the Democratic side. Is I mean, you know, we have very few, you know, Jimmy Carter's who come out of nowhere and become nominees. Generally, over the, you know, going back to Nixon, there's been somebody anointed. I mean, Ronald Reagan runs against Gerald Ford. He doesn't make it, but he gets it the next time. His loyal vice president, George Bush, makes it. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think that, and then Bob Dole runs, at one time doesn't make it, then he becomes the nominee. And then I think in the case of, you know, George Bush the Younger, you had, I think, you know, a little bit of, you know, buyer's remorse and some were going to make it up to Papa Bush for what we did last time. And, but I think there almost was somebody anointed by sort of this time. And this time I do not think there is. I think, I think people believe that McCain has the best chance of, of winning a general election. They're not sure they want to nominate him. And that's always been a, 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 pro, a struggle for Republicans. You can go back to the days. A lot of people I know and, and believe that when the Republican Party nominated Nixon in, 1990, in 1968, they thought he was going to lose. But they'd rather have a loser, their kind of guy who's a loser, than nominate Rockefeller, who was a sure winner. Uh, because if he had all these misfortunes, having his baby born right before the California primary and all these things. But, but I think that for the first time, I think you know, you're seeing a, a new strain that I can remember of, of pragmatism. I think a lot of conservative Republicans are thinking they'll buy in to McCain if that, that, that's the only way they can get the White House. Because right now, there doesn't seem to be another alternative. Now, as Mary Beth says, I mean, all of this is so early. We've got so much time to go that, you know, McCain and Senator Clinton and all the rest of them could disappear by the time we get to, the, to Iowa or New Hampshire. But right now, I think there's, a, there's sort of a new strain of, of pragmatism on, on the Republican side, which I've not seen for a long time. Okay, let's go to questions. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Someone will bring a microphone to you. And uh, remember, as is always our rule here, no speeches. Please ask a question. It's on. Mary Beth, you said um, women vote for women. Is that true across the board, all the identifiable demographic groups, age, no. income, no. education, geography, and political affiliation? I think all elections have, you know, the people on both sides of the spectrum, the, the, the Republican devotees that immediately are going to vote for a Republican, the Democratic devotees, the strong believers who are going to vote for them. General elections are largely won in this country by late deciders because we've had, you know, this is a very closely divided country right now. And so, especially in national elections, you know, it was 48-48 almost all the way through the Kerry campaign, as you know just as well as I do. And, you know, you would have a little advantage one day and, and um, a little less the next. But often it is non-college educated women who are among the latest deciders because, you know, they have jobs and families and they haven't been paying as much attention to the race as people like you and me do. And they, in the last, they broke for Bush at the end because they, if you recall, there was an Osama bin Laden tape on the Friday night before the election and 
we were stopped dead in our tracks after that because once again, terrorism and security had, had reinserted itself in the race. Um, for women candidates, often it's well-educated women who, immediate, who are, for Democrats or Republicans, the first people who decide for the candidate because they want to see more people like them representing them. Um, and then, you know, they, depending on the issues that the women uh, candidates espouse, they pick up. But there's less resistance to women candidates, generally, among women voters than there are across all segments of the male population. And, you know, I, I've always been the beneficiary of self-identified liberal men, so, you know, um, I don't say that with any malice, but it, it, it is the fact of how elections have gone in the last couple of years in this country. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd especially like Mary Beth's insights on this, but it'd be nice to hear from all three of you about it, because I was very much impressed uh, in terms of the climate uh, by the president's nomination of a female for the Supreme Court who was unqualified. And I wondered how this hurt the cause of females in general in Washington. And it, it may sound like it only impinges on this topic, but I think it's, it's sort of central that now we're, we're back to eight to one on the Supreme Court. Thank you. I'm sure that Ruth Bader Ginsburg feels the same way that you do about this. Um, and she isn't going to like Mikulski, when she was in, when she was the only Democratic woman, said that some women wait for Prince Charming. Not me. I was waiting for Patty and Barbara and Hillary and other women to come along and be here and sit at this table with me. I think in the case of Harriet Meyer's nomination, you know, I, I was in the Senate, as Tom was, for a long time and listened to Republicans say, we want a straight up or down vote. That's all we want. We want a straight up or down vote. And all of a sudden, the Republican right said that Harriet Myers was not qualified for a straight up and down vote. That's the first time that that happened. And just because they were not sure that she was going to be Ideologically, and it's a, the Supreme Court is an incredibly important office and place to hold, as you know, the, our judicial colleagues uh, here tonight will tell us. But you know, I, I think I share Laura Bush's disappointment that there was a chance to at least keep two women in um, in on the court, and that didn't happen. I think that uh, the the, the the operative point here is that was not that there was a, a democratic op opposition, but that the Republican right, for some reason, turned on Harriet Myers, and and generally Bush has found that you know he likes to nominate friends, and that she was a, a a reliable a reliable friend. She's apparently a perfectly capable lawyer, but she was not a known quantity to the, uh, and they seem to the the Republican right has pretty much interested in getting appellate judges where you've got a lot of years to look at the uh, to, to look at the record even though you know if you take Stevens or Blackman or or uh, even Sandra Day O'Connor what they looked like when they were nominated and what they turned out is usually a, there's usually a huge disparity but I, I agree that the, you know putting aside whether Harriet Myers is qualified to be a Supreme Court justice or not I think the symbolism of, uh, of you know you know take, uh, returning this to you know, to 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 eight men is uh, is uh, is probably it was a mistake, and I think it would it would make sense that if he gets another one to make sure that, you know, he always thought that Bush was going to appoint you know appoint another woman and probably appoint a Hispanic, and neither one of those things have been done. And you know, symbols matter in politics, and I think that uh, you know you can and you can talk about it. You know, we were looking for the best possible person, but the fact of the matter is, if you have, you know, nine Irish Catholics. I don't think that's what you want. I think you want a you want a, you want a Supreme Court that's representative of the country. And I think it's uh, I think most of the female senators who spoke on this felt, you know, fairly strongly that it should be a woman. And in fact, at least six of them wrote a letter to the president asking him to appoint Sandra Day O'Connor as the chief justice before Roberts. Um, you both stressed the importance of fundraising. Uh, for any woman candidate, 
To, to what extent do you think that fundraising, is sort of gamesmanship of, of collecting that much money, uh, affects the democracy as a whole? Do you think we're getting the best candidates and that those candidates are earning the most money, or do you think that the money game is hurting the democracy at all? Well, I, in my opinion, uh, I think one of the uh, one of the criteria on whether or not you're a, an effective candidate is whether or not you can raise money. And I don't mean that you can write your own check. What I mean is that you can raise money. I mean, it's, you know, if you give $5 to my campaign, you're committed. And, and, and I think that, I think it's one of the ways you measure the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ability of, I think the numbers have gotten astronomical. And now that so many presidential candidates are opting out of the public financing, uh, you know, you're getting to the point now where these campaigns are, you know, Kerry and Dean and Bush all opted out of this, which... In the primary. Right. And, I, and as, as a result, in the primary. And, and I think as a, as a consequence, you know, the, the numbers are going higher and higher. Uh, I also think that one of the unintended results recently that, you know, if you go back 15 years, there was a, a concern about PACs. The PACs were considered to be kind of an evil influence and so forth and so on. You now have a situation where as the individual limits were increased in some of the recent campaign finance decisions, you now, uh, a husband and wife can give $2,100 each in the primary and $2,100 in the general for a total of $8,400. A PAC, which could be a thousand different people contributing, can only give 10. So you can now have a, you know, you've got a, you've changed the, the, the equation so that now individuals, a, a dinner party of 10, 15, or 20 people can be, can, can provide a very substantial amount of money, more than, for example, all of the employees at, you know, at Firestone or the UAW or whatever it might be. So I think, uh, to some extent, that balance has to be redressed. And a lot of the campaign finance laws have not taken a, into account, uh, you know, inflation. I mean, the, that $1,000 limit was a lot of money in 1972. It wasn't very much when they, when they finally changed it. But I don't have, in terms of the amount of money spent on campaigns, yes, it's, it's high, but every time we try to... Uh, you know, we try to change the rules, we wind up with things like, you know, 527s and independent expenditures and things which, as a campaign manager, you're just terrified of. Because, you know, I can control my own people and where my money's spent. Barely. Barely. But, but, but when you get to the point where other people are coming and doing it, saying, you know, you know vote, vote, vote for X or vote against Y, you get blamed for stuff over which you have really no control. And I'd rather see all the money come from one, from one source. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, I also think that I'd rather have the parties have more influence, even if they're doing independent expenditures, and have it be done by the swift boat people, or you know, or Progress for America, or or Progress for America, or uh, or for that matter, uh, George Soros. Or uh, right. I think actually that 2004 really changed the way money is raised in our campaigns. I said before that. This is a very closely divided country, and there was a lot of passion on both sides of the, um, of the aisle here in the presidential campaign. As Democrats, we were really worried that we didn't have as much access to people who had $8,200 per family to give. And how were we, we, we were gonna get buried. We were never going to be able to make up that difference. But from my point of view, starting with the Dean campaign and then growing exponentially with Kerry. Citizens who had never been involved in politics before said, I have a very strong view about this. And so whether it's online, I'm going to contribute online, I'm going to give to my local uh, Democratic Party, I'm going to you know, give to ACT, I'm going to do whatever. I mean, I never really left the campaign office for a year. But the one thing that I did do was you could look on our website and see where there was going to be a small dollar fundraiser in your zip code or your area. And like three times a week, I would go and be a speaker in somebody's living room who was going to raise maybe $5,000 or $8,000 because they just decided with their friends and their, in their neighborhood, they were going to get involved in this. And that really changed things. I mean. If you had told me, we, we were comparing notes about like how far you were down financially to the Bush campaign at various points, and he won on that one. But when we won the nomination effectively in Wisconsin, we had $2.3 million. 
and the Bush campaign had $117 million. And they started to spend it the next day, and it came down on our heads like a ton of bricks. And we had to figure out how we were going to amass enough money to stay alive, you know, to how to run a general election. We ended up raising more money for the DNC than the RNC raised. That had never happened. That has never happened before, I don't think. And it was small dollar donors that made all the difference in that. I think that entire class, like after the, the election, I couldn't walk through an airport without somebody saying to me, you sent me an email. Because the Kerry campaign would send out these emails from me and you know, saying like, this is what I'm gonna do next. And we need this much money. And it really, you know, I would sit down with the guys who, who did the online fundraising, say like what we were gonna try to do in the next two weeks, and then they would send it out. And all these people were deeply involved in what it was we were trying to do. I think that that is incredibly encouraging. And I think that that is not gonna go away because I think going into the next um, presidential campaign, the country is still gonna be closely divided and that this is actually gonna even the playing field. We have time for a couple more questions. I'm sure there's more questions. You got one back here? Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about the importance of media coverage and also that hairstyles and clothing are going to be obviously factors in a woman's campaign. So my question is, um, what about women's magazines and tabloids that you don't usually see presidential candidates in? I mean, maybe people or time, but not glamour, not in style, not L. How much of just free media coverage all across the country do you think those are going to play? And do you think that hurts a woman's chances of being perceived as a strong military leader or as a more masculine figure? No. I, I, I think that you want to get into as many outlets as possible and you want to reach as many women voters as possible. La Ladies Home Journal or Glamour or any, or any of these um, magazines have like three and a half month lead time on their articles. And so you can't use them as a way to break news because they're just not in that business. What they are in the business of is giving more information about an individual or about that person's, and, and you remember I think that in 92, the Clintons, the first time anybody ever saw Chelsea was in an article in People Magazine, which was something that was very much discussed, whether this is something that they ought to do. But nobody saw that family together. And that decision really worked very well, I think, for the Clinton campaign. I, I don't mean to say, because I don't believe it, that a woman's hairstyle gets covered more than anything that she says. I just think that you have to just decide what it is and stick with it. It's the same for your positions as it is for your hair. So. I think that it, you know, there's, uh, you know, you should take advantage of, you know, whatever opportunities you have in the media, and it seems to me that, you know, women's magazines have a natural interest in, in uh, women, you know, probably like, you know, Guns and Ammo wants to cover a, a man. I mean, it's, uh, I think that, uh, uh, I didn't mean to suggest that, uh, that uh, you know, that hairstyle is the most important thing there is. I just said it, it is, it becomes a distraction, and you have to make sure that it is not a distraction, so that you can... They, it, so they will listen to what you have to say. And I think that is, uh, uh, I also think that uh, to go back to the point that uh, uh, Mary Beth made about the internet, I think that uh, one of the things that we had, we had a lot of luck uh, in 2000 uh, with, uh, when we did we're relatively early. I mean, it became refined in 2004. But in 2000, we raised a fair amount of money uh, that, we, that we did raise on the internet just by going blind to lists of women. And we, we were able to bring more, more and more people into the process, small donors. And I agree with Mary Beth that, you know, there, the more, you know, obviously the ideal thing would be that if you have 280 million Americans and everybody gave a dollar, that isn't going to happen. But I think that's an optimal situation that I think, it, you know, it invests you in the process. And I think that, the, you know, when you have a situation where, you know, half or slightly more than half of the people vote, you know, that, you, whatever you can do that brings more people into this process means that you're much more likely to get leaders that the people really want. Uh, and I think one final point on these, on these, these some of these women's magazines. Uh, one of the audiences that Mary Beth again just said was that with late deciders is women who, who st stay at home, not not professional women, but who, who tend to be early deciders. But 
that's one way to reach them. I mean, it is through through women's magazines and get them a chance and get them to vote. Because the other way, you know, is to you know is to you know that you that you succeed if you're a, if you're a female is you know try and try and increase the size of the universe and you know and, and and increase the number of women who actually vote. And you know that a lot of elections are decided by the by the fringe people who may or may not come out at the end. And media such as that is one way to reach people who are you know, historically don't vote in large numbers, uh, and, and that tends to be, uh, you know, uh, women with less than a college education. You're, we're speaking a little bit about women's media, but let me ask this question, um, and I'll direct this, Mary Beth, to you, but Tom, I'd like uh, any feedback that you would have, but if you were running, running a woman's campaign for president, would you embrace the support of the traditional women's interest groups, or do you think that that would make your woman look even more like a woman candidate as opposed to looking like a candidate for president? Well, any, any woman who runs for president, if she's a good candidate, I, I think it's hard to run first time you run for something for president. And I think Tom has more or less said that tonight. Almost any candidate that I would be involved with would have been supported by women's organizations in the past. If she were suddenly to say, I don't want your endorsement, that's a story. Whereas it's just part of her, her past, her past relationships. I, I think that you cause more of a problem by turning your back, male or female, on your friends, people who helped you get to where you are, people who supported you early, than you do by uh, you know, just accepting what they can do for you and want to do with you. And you know, every presidential campaign on the right and on the left there are interest groups that want you to do something that you're not going to do. And that is a day-to-day -day part of politics, and you just have to work your way through it. Um, so my suggestion would be that you just accept the, the um, support and be grateful for it. I agree with that. I think you, know, you, know, you, you dance with those that brung you. And, uh, and you know, if there are people that much have gotten, way to put it, gotten you to the place that you're in today, I mean, you, know, if they, you, know, you, you continue to have their support. And, you know, and increase it in concentric circles, broaden it as much as you can, but turning your back on the people who have supported you, and, and you know, it, it's with, you know, Elizabeth was an unusual situation, but virtually anybody else who's running for president is almost certainly going to have won several previous offices, and, uh, and they have a fairly substantial, you know, group of people on the, you know, on the, on the issue side, on the financial side, and, and I also th think, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, what you say are, are women's interest groups, you know, it tends to be things like the Women's Campaign Fund or people that are involved on one side of the abortion issue. But other than that, I mean, you know, if they're for education, they tend to have, a lot of these groups tend to have both sexes, not just women. Yeah. Okay, back here. Do we have any information whether any one of the following three factors has an effect upon a woman being successful? in uh, running a campaign for presidency. The percentage of voters registered, that's the first factor. The second one, voter turnout. And the third factor is the electoral college. Do any of those factors increase or decrease the chances of a, pre a woman becoming president? Well, I think, first of all, this is another matter that is particular and not generic. And in 2004, we had the highest turnout that we've, we had since 1968. Um, participation in general elections in this country had been steadily declining. But because there were such strong feelings on both sides, more people came out to vote. The thing that for me was the most encouraging is Gore won the youngest cohort of voters, age 18 to 30, by plus two. Kerry won it by plus nine. How you vote, the first two times you vote, has an awful lot to do with your voting behavior for the rest of your life. Some people make a quantum difference as they get older, but most people don't. I think that that's very encouraging for us, for my party. I think that the more people who vote, I agree with Tom, the better it is for the country. Because then you have leaders that people feel invested in. And they feel as though, even if they lost, that a good fight was fought. The Electoral College, I mean, obviously we've had a contentious national history in the last couple of years, and in 2004 we were ready for four recounts, and we had four teams of lawyers, because we thought that there was a possibility that there were several places where we would be in a Florida-like situation. 
I think anything like that undermines people's faith in the voting system. And John Kerry made the decision, even though some people wanted him to contest Ohio, it was in the neighborhood of 60,000 votes. And there was no way that that was going to change around. 60,000 votes, do not, I've done recounts, do not change, around, change in a recount. I think it's important for leaders of both parties to say, we have to have faith in the system that allows us to elect our leaders. The Electoral College, to my mind, once again, John Adams, is something that has outlived its usefulness, just because we have so many more means of knowing where people are and recording who is where and knowing more about the states, and we don't have the you know, faraway territories. I think it's outlived its usefulness, but I think it's like seven times there's been an, an attempt to get rid of the Electoral College. At electoral College, and for some reason or another, it never works. I think it, with respect to the Electoral College, it's the, it's this, uh, the small state dominance uh, which prevents that from happening. But, you know, we, I think we all hope we'll never have a, another situation in which the, you know, the popular vote goes one way and the Electoral College goes uh, the other way. I think, you know, this country is so mobile and, uh, you know, people in the targeting now is, is so extreme and, and people, you know, the people are focusing on neighborhoods. They're not, it's not so much on states. And I think the Electoral College uh, is an anachronism. I think whether we'll ever get rid of it, I do not know. But I, I think it is, after what we went through in 2000, I don't think anybody wants to go through that again. Uh, and, you know, you know when, you have a, when you have a raw vote that's, a, you know, a half a million dollars in favor of one candidate and the other candidate wins the White House, I think it's a credit to this country that there weren't, you know, there weren't riots in the streets, that, you know, the people accepted it, Al Gore accepted it, and, the, and we went forward, and, and I think that's a credit to the strength of this, of this democracy. I still think it's an anachronism. As far as women go, I think women vote in, in a larger proportion to their numbers. They are a majority anyway, but they vote in larger percentages than, than men and have uh, every year since 1980. Therefore, uh, you know, women obviously have a proportionately larger impact on the outcome of an election than, uh, than men and, and, you know, that it would make sense for any candidate if, uh, and it's true, that female, that female voters tend to like, uh, like women and women vote in large numbers, that should give, you know, a modest electoral advantage to, uh, to a, a, a female candidate. Again, Depending That's, on that. you, know, a, you know, generalities, uh, uh, you know, all generalities are wrong, including this one. But I think it depends a lot on the specific candidate. But assuming that, you know, uh, all of the things being equal, there's uh, proportionately more women voting. We have time for one last question right here. The lady has been trying. <laughs> uh, 21 or 22 years ago in our state senate, we had one woman senator. Uh, a year or two later, we had two. A few years later, we had three or four. There was a definite change in the atmosphere in the Senate, where before it was frowning and growling and all business. After there were a few women there, there was a lot more courtesy, smiles and jokes, even though the politics was the same. Do you see any change in the atmosphere in Washington if we were to have a woman president? Or is that just because this was 20 years ago and that was our social climate at the time? Well, I think that I really agree with what Tom said early on, which is that women candidates are outside the circle of power, usually. I mean, they work their way in over the course of a career. But in all of this Abramoff scandal and all of the lobbying stuff that's going on in Washington right now, there, I think there's only been one woman, um, Shelley Amor Capito from West Virginia, who has even been mentioned in this. And there have been, in the neighborhood of 60-something members of Congress who have been mentioned. I think in 2006, when there's been a lot of discussion about the way the, con the Congress discusses, you know, conducts its business, people are going to look to change the way business gets done. And women candidates are one of the easiest ways to, uh, to change that. 
you know, I have known a lot of candidates, as has Tom, and you know, some of them are pleasant and some of them are not. And, and that all depends on them personally and not what their gender is, in my experience. But I do think that you shake up an institution by shaking up the background of the people that come into it. And so I think the Congress is, we have a, as I said at the beginning, we have a long way to go. But the Congress is a better place with the women that are there. And it, you know, as we begin to achieve you know, greater parity, it will be even better. And more to the point, it will be more representative of the nation. I just have a couple of thoughts to add to that. Uh, the first one is that I think if you all think of the, your own place of uh, where you work, I know that I've found and I hired a lot of staffs over the years, and if it was all male or it was all female, behavior was almost invariably worse than if there was a certain am amount of both. I mean, women behave badly towards women, men behave badly towards men, or they misbehave in different ways, but you know, if there's a certain number of each, the environment tends to be better. And the second thing in terms of a woman president, I just think, you know, I've got two daughters, and uh, I just think it, it basically says, you know, that the old idea that every, and anybody can grow up to be president now means anybody, not any, any, and not any man, but anybody. And I think the symbol that is for, you know, for every single, you know, female child that's born is, is going to be, uh, you know, terribly, terribly important uh, for the country. And, and, you know, you know, you shouldn't, nobody's aspiration should be limited in, in this society. And I think that's why it would be a terribly important symbolic thing when it happens. Well, this has been a wonderful evening, and I want to thank Mary Beth Cahill and Tom Daffron for joining us here on the University of <laughs> Kansas campus. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight, and we hope to see you next Tuesday night at 7.30 for the final uh, event in this series. Thank you, and good night. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Nice to see you.